And Jacob saw in his sleep a ladder standing upon the earth, and the top thereof touching heaven, and the angels also of God ascending and descending by it. And the Lord leaning upon the ladder, saying to him, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The father of Western monasticism, St. Benedict, uses this passage in his holy rule, saying, Brethren, the Holy Scripture cries to us, saying, Everyone that exalts himself shall be humbled, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Hence, brethren, if we wish to reach the greatest height of humility and speedily to arrive at that heavenly exaltation to which ascent is made in the present life by humility, then mounting by our actions, we must erect the ladder which appeared to Jacob in his dream, by means of which angels were shown to him ascending and descending. Without a doubt, we understand this ascending and descending to be nothing else but that we descend by pride and ascend by humility. St. Benedict. Jacob had sinned by his lying to his father Isaac, but God had not abandoned him. Rather, God gives him a chance to climb, to grow in humility. To do this, Jacob will need the Christ, the anointed rock, who will humble himself to be found in the form of man on this earth, at the foot of the ladder. Also, St. Ephraim explains by this dream, God shows Jacob the secret care he gives to him. His angels are surrounding him day and night. Jacob will learn humility in the coming years under Laban, in order to climb the ladder. St. Benedict goes on, he says, The erected ladder, however, is our life in this present world, which, if the heart is humble, is by the Lord lifted up to heaven. For we say that our body and our soul are the two sides of this ladder, And into these sides, the divine calling hath inserted various degrees of humility or discipline which we must mount. The first degree of humility, then, is that a man always have the fear of God before his eyes, shunning all forgetfulness, and that he be ever mindful of all that God hath commanded, that he always considers in his mind how those who despise God will burn in hell for their sins, and that life everlasting is prepared for those who fear God. And whilst he guards himself evermore against sin and vices of thought, word, and deed, and self-will, let him also hasten to cut off the desires of the flesh." Let him hasten to cut off all the desires of the flesh. On July 6, 1902, it's actually the feast of the precious blood at that time, in that place. St. Maria Goretti died in a hospital. She was stabbed 14 times by Alessandro Serenelli on the previous day and miraculously lived another day. She was attacked because she would not submit to sinning with this young man. She was 11. He was 19. He had no fear of God in his soul because he made no attempt to overcome his inordinate desires of the flesh, both in viewing impure images and acting upon them. He was not even at the first rung of the ladder. He had no fear of God, no humility, and demons, demons were his angel helpers. St. Benedict goes on. He says, let a man consider that God always sees him from heaven, that the eye of God beholds his works everywhere, and that the angels report them to him every hour. The Lord knows the thoughts of men, says King David. As regards the desires of the flesh, 
Let us believe that God is thus ever present to us. We must therefore guard thus against evil desires. Because death hath his station near the entrance of pleasure. Death hath his station near the entrance of pleasure, says St. Benedict. Whence the scripture commands saying, go not after thy lusts. Again, thank you, St. Benedict. Death came to Maria because of the unlawful desires of a man. Maria Goretti was humble and high up the ladder, even though she had just received her first Holy Communion on the previous May 29th. She was planning on receiving again on July 6th, the day she died. I believe she did receive her viaticum. Her second communion was her viaticum. Soon after her first communion on May 29th, she heard an indecent exchange of words between a young man and one of his female companions. She said with indignation to her mother, Mother, how terribly this girl speaks. She responded, be very careful not to ever take part in such conversations. I can't even think of it, mother. Rather than do it, I would prefer to die. Here is one who had fear of God and controlled her curiosity. When she was being attacked, she repeatedly told Alessandro, it was a sin. Stop. St. Benedict, again, helps us. If, therefore, the eyes of the Lord observe the good and the bad, and the Lord always looks down from heaven on the children of men to see whether there be anyone that understands or seeks God, and if our actions are reported to the Lord day and night by the angels who are appointed to watch over us daily, we must ever be on our guard, brethren. As the prophet says in the psalm, that God may at no time see us gone aside to evil and become unprofitable. And having spared us in the present time, because he is kind and waits for us to be changed for the better, says to us in the future, These things thou hast done, and I was silent, as we read in the Psalms. Thank you, St. Benedict. Jacob learned in a dream that God, El Shaddai, God of the mountain, God all-powerful, God almighty, saw all things, and that he was even watching over him day and night, that God loved him and wanted him to climb this ladder. When Jacob awaked out of sleep, he said, Indeed, the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And trembling, he said, How terrible! How awesome is this place? This is no other but the house of God and the gate of heaven. When St. Maria was dying, she professed more than once to the priest that she wanted Alessandro to be with her in heaven. Yes, I forgive him for the love of Jesus. And I want him to come with me to paradise. I want him at my side. May God forgive him because I have already forgiven him. Although it took some years of imprisonment, visits from priests and a bishop, and a dream from heaven with little Maria at the top of the ladder, urging Alessandro to fear God, the sinner repented and began to climb. He started to build a life on the anointed rock, who is Christ. Like Jacob, he would spend many years growing in humility. And how wonderful is humility? It is the gateway to heaven, even for the greatest sinners. It has the ability to turn past sins into fertilizer. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. There's a passage in Scripture that states, when they sow the wind... They shall reap the whirlwind. When they sow the wind, they shall reap the whirlwind. This passage certainly came true for the assailant of St. Maria Garetti, Alessandro Serenelli. Since the little virgin martyr took him under her care and wanted him to 
with, in heaven with her. Let's spend a little time then looking into his life as well. Long after his crime, he said, My mother died when I was a few years old. I never knew her. Without a mother's tender care and direction, my life started out on the wrong foot. His father, Giovanni, was often sickly from malaria. They lived in the swamps, and he was overworked, and he was negligent of his duties toward his son. Not surprisingly, then, after Alessandro learned to read, he was introduced to anti-clerical and atheistic literature, common at the time, revolutionary Italy. In the magazines, he read about murders. For example, one article described a working girl who was stabbed to death by a mad lover in the 1830s. He underlined wicked passages that aren't fitting to even say from the pulpit at this late date. He underlined passages from various articles. From this alone, we can see the poor young man was being filled with messages emanating from hell. All this served to inflame his desires and deaden his conscience. We know the crime he finally committed, putting into action what he had read and pondered over so long. Apparently, what appealed to him and attracted him to Maria was not just lust, but it was the immolation of the pure, which meant to him a secret defiance of society, a perversion of goodness an act of revolution, things he had read about in his magazines. We must never forget this basic principle, first an intention and last an execution. First an intention and last an execution. Let us not put senseless in worldly ideas in our minds. Let us fight bad thoughts and desires lest we eventually put them into action. Garbage in will lead to garbage out. Think of all the garbage, rubbish, evil people are putting into their minds today via TV, internet, movies, and Hollywood. It will come out somehow, and it won't be good. After Maria refused to acquiesce to his desires, after having approached her more than once. In a rage, he struck her 14 times with a broad brush hook, a special farm implement. Four of these strikings were definitely fatal. Again, it was miraculous she lived another day. He was soon taken to the local police station where he made a full confession. He never sought to escape. He did not hide or deny anything. He showed no remorse. Here is part of his confession. During the spring, thoroughly bored with a peasant's life to the neck, I conceived a desire for Marietta, which I had no reason to remove from my mind. First an intention, last an execution. I had no reason, no fear of God, no reason to remove from my mind. I proposed my intention to her. She refused, and from then on avoided me. That threw the fat into the fire. I determined that I would have her or kill her. Yesterday, I reached the end of my patience. I told myself that it had to be one way or the other. I would no longer bear frustration. When I pulled her into the kitchen, I threatened her with the brush hook to accommodate my desire or die. I did not expect her to resist me as furiously as she did. Her virtue was greater than its lust. With her final refusal and outcry, that was it. I rained down hard blows with the brush hook upon her as though I were stripping corn or chopping wood. She fell, and I left her for dead, thinking surely that no one could survive such a hewing. Realizing escape from the open marshes was futile. I hid the brush hook behind the toolbox, locked myself in my room, cast myself upon the bed, and awaited the inevitable. 
taken to Rome for trial. He did not try to excuse himself in any way and even frustrated the lawyers who tried to get his sentence reduced or pleaded insanity for him. He made no defense for himself, but he did defend Marietta, saying, Maria Goretti did not lend cause to my desire or lead me on in any way. Apprised of my intention, she did her best not to let it come about. She was a little girl, good and pure. That drew me. The result was the full sentence. Three years in solitary confinement. 27 years of hard labor. In the courtroom, St. Maria's mother, Asunta, had the last word. I forgive Alessandro, she exclaimed. After a stunning silence, many cried out indignantly, Never! And it should not be! And I would never forgive him! Was yelled out. But she quickly faced those who spoke thus, saying, And suppose in turn Jesus Christ does not forgive us. He survived the first three years, of which the nights were the hardest. He never dreamed. He made matchboxes, for which he was paid 20 cents per thousand. Or later he made fibers from palms for weaving. After surviving this difficult part of his sentence, he learned that three others with the same sentence had killed themselves, and six had gone mad. Out of ten, he was the only one who survived insane. Still, his heart was unmoved. Resentful and cynical of society and religion, bitterness gnawed at him. Like a broken record, he kept thinking, Was not her stubbornness as mad as my desire, if only she had submitted? Obviously, an intervention from above was needed. After six years of imprisonment, the little virgin martyr came to him in the dream we all know about, showing him 14 lilies for the 14 wounds. When she came to him all dressed in white, it was he now who wanted to flee from her. She offered him the lilies, saying, Alessandro, Alessandro, take them. He accepted them one by one. He took them, and as he took them, they turned into so many splendid flames. She then said, Alessandro, as I have promised, your soul shall someday reach me in heaven. And he was filled with contentment, wonder of wonders. His desire was to be purified of all evil and be fulfilled in heaven with a purely spiritual friendship with this virgin. Awesome is this place. Then he awoke, and it seemed that the rabid, choking, hellish, consuming feelings of hate, destruction, and bitterness that had ruled him for so long began to dissolve into the love of the virgin martyr. He changed after that. He started to relate to others. He showed interest in them, as well as his labors. He surprised many with his transformation from a sullen loner to a cheerful and cooperative friend. After a time, the bishop came to visit him. Alessandro said to him, I want to cast myself upon God's mercy. I want to beg pardon from the family of her whom I destroyed. I want to go on hands and knees before Assunta Goretti and her children for what I have done. He then gave himself over with complete submission to confession, attendance at Mass, Holy Communion, and prayer. He prayed most especially to Marietta. He became a model prisoner. And to fill his spare time, he read lots of good books written by great authors too. Catholic authors as well as books like Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, which was his favorite, if you know that book. It fits him perfectly. See how all the knots the devil helped him tie before his conversion were now being untied by God and his grace? 
He even began to seek solitude voluntarily to be closer to God and to meditate upon his wonders. Eventually, he was let out of prison in 1929, three years early. He thought this too was from Marietta. But now new troubles began for him. Wherever he would find work, although he never complained, he never blasphemed or gave way to rage. He was the first in the field and the last to leave. He scrupulously obeyed orders. When others discovered who he was, he was inevitably asked to leave. Amazingly, various women tried to seduce him. One woman, another Potiphar's wife, the wife of the employer, said to him after trying to seduce him, You killed a girl for this very same thing I freely offer you. Have you become so holy since then, and do you fear a woman? Like Joseph, he ran. He was saying no to what he had said yes to previously. Another time he was wrongly jailed merely on suspicion. These sorts of things kept happening to him over and over again. The devil wanted him back. God, however, is good and gives us the chance to undo past wrongs. For every yes we've said, he'll give us a chance to say no and undo it. He finally found peace with a Capuchin monastery. When they received him as a lay brother, he became their gardener. Meanwhile, he met up with Asunta. Do you recognize me? He asked her. Yes, my son. She responded tearfully. He threw himself at her feet and cried, Do you forgive me, Asunta? Dear Asunta, forgive me, forgive me what I have done to Marietta and to you. Asunta placed her hands upon his head, caressed his face and said, Alessandro, Marietta forgave you. Christ has forgiven you. And why should I not also forgive? I forgive you, of course, my son. He arose and they embraced. And it was Christmas time coming up. Asunta Goretti, with head held high and tears falling, took Alessandro Serronelli by the hand as a mother takes a son and led him to Mass. At the altar rail, side by side, she and he, who had killed her daughter, raised their open mouths to partake of the flesh and the blood of Jesus in Holy Communion at peace with God and with each other. At Asunta's death, he wept and cried, Dearest Mama Asunta, collapsing upon her bed at her feet, he kissed them, and then her hands and her face. At night, he always said his rosary before the candle-lighted picture of Marietta, saying, Marietta, I wait for death. I await and long for the fulfillment of your promise, your promise that I will be by your side in paradise. He fulfilled her promise with his peaceful death in 1970. This story is in a way the story of two fathers, one who neglected his duties toward his children and the other who did not, even after death. When Alessandro approached Maria, in an evil way for the first time. She prayed aloud to her recently deceased and beloved father, Babo. Babo, Babo, watching me from heaven, save Alessandro from sin, she yelled. Maria's beloved father, whom she called Babo, had passed away from malaria when Maria was nine. He was quite saintly and died in the odor of sanctity. All during her death, agony, Maria not only called upon the holy names of Jesus and Mary, but also upon her saintly father, Babo. She had a fatherly connection while on earth and in heaven through him. And it helped her immensely to survive her time of great distress and to prevent her from falling into sin. Alessandro's father was careless, did not take up his role in raising his son properly, watching over him and guiding him. The story of these two might be framed in the actions of their prospective fathers, Maria and Alessandro, Babo and Giovanni. Good fathers keep the ladder in mind and help their children to climb. And by their climbing, others can make their way up too. 
even great sinners. It was said of St. Thomas that as a child he was so holy and virtuous that it seemed as if he was free of original sin, that is, St. Thomas Aquinas. When a famine broke out in the city, his family had a castle in, it was said that he gave away so much food and provisions to the poor that people worried that he would literally give everything they had away. One time his father caught him on his way to give food to the poor beggars outside the walls of the castle and angrily commanded Thomas to open the cloak that was carrying the provisions. When Thomas opened it, the food miraculously turned into sweet-smelling flowers, and his father, seeing that Thomas was evidently doing the will of God, repented and let Thomas continue to feed the poor. When Thomas decided to join the Dominicans, his mother was extremely upset and angry with him, for she wanted him to join the prestigious Benedictine Abbey of Monte Cassino since his uncle was the abbot and would presumably make Thomas the abbot in years to come. Due to his insistence on joining the Dominicans, she had him locked into a tower and sent his two sisters every day to try and convince him to forget his idea of joining the Dominicans. However, after meeting with Thomas a few times, one of his sisters ended up deciding to join religious life herself. His mother, becoming even more upset by the fact that St. Thomas's sister had joined his side, sent his two brothers to try and convince him. By diabolical inspiration, his brothers decided to send a prostitute to Thomas's tower in order to dissuade him from religious life in any respect if he wasn't going to do it with the Benedictines. The prostitute, however, ran out of the tower screaming after Thomas brandished a glowing hot fire poker. After she ran away, Thomas knelt in prayer and fell asleep from exhaustion. He dreamt that two angels appeared and tied a cincture around his waist, and the pain was so great that he woke up with a loud yell. This was an angelic cincture of chastity, and after this, he admits to having never suffered even the slightest impure thought for the rest of his life. God gave Thomas this singular grace in order that Thomas might be the great doctor and theologian he was. For, as Thomas teaches us, impurity is one of, if not the greatest, dullers of the intellect. The other greatest duller of the intellect, of course, is pride. Unsurprisingly, then, St. Thomas revealed to a confessor that God preserved him from any and all temptations of pride as well. This was, again, so that his intellect would be like that of an angel. Thus, he is called the angelic doctor. This title is fitting for him, for St. Thomas teaches us, when angels see something in their intellect, they immediately grasp it in its entirety and have perfect knowledge of it. Thomas's intellect was so sharp that it truly seemed as if he did, in fact, have the intellect of an angel. For during the year that he was in the tower, he memorized the entire Bible, among other things. When he was finally freed and sent to the university where the Dominicans were trained, it was said that he knew more than all of his fellow students and even most of his teachers, and thus he kept silent in class out of humility. This earned Thomas the nickname, the dumb ox, since everyone thought he was silent on account of stupidity. One fellow student felt so bad for Thomas that he offered to tutor Thomas, and Thomas accepted the kind help out of humility. However, as Chesterton put it, Thomas's love for truth overpowered his great humility, and on one difficult topic, the tutor made a mistake, and Thomas explained the difficult topic to the tutor with perfect clarity. The student then begged Thomas to be his tutor instead. St. Albert the Great, one of the teachers of St. Thomas, had Thomas defend one of the most difficult theses in front of the entire school, and Thomas did so with such ease that Albert remarked that although they had called him the dumb ox, his bellows would resound throughout the world. This prophecy, of course, came true in spades, for again, St. Thomas is the doctor of the church. Moreover, as we will discuss later on, his bellows reached so far that all of modern philosophy can be described purely in reference to him. But more on that later. It was said that when St. Thomas had books written, he would have four scribes, each writing a different book for Thomas in four corners of the room. Thomas would take turns watching, walking to each one, dictating what to write for maybe a paragraph or so, and then move on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one managing to keep his train of thought for four different works intact at the same time. 
And if anyone here has read St. Thomas's work, he can attest that these books of his are not exactly light reading. St. Thomas would go to monasteries and friaries of different religious communities to debate, and they would kick him out because he would take on all of their theologians at once and shred their arguments with such kindness, gentleness, and charity that it just drove them crazy. He was also a holy mystic. He was known to levitate and break into ecstasy while celebrating Mass. He healed several people while he was still alive, and of course, after he died as well. One night, he was writing his commentary on Isaiah, and the secretary heard several voices coming from his room. St. Thomas left his room, and the secretary saw that no one else left the room. He then asked Thomas who the other voices were. St. Thomas said he would tell him, but only if he promised to tell no one until after his death. Thomas said that Saints Peter and Paul appeared and explained the passage to him. However, not only would Saints Peter and Paul appear to Thomas regarding his writing, but so would Christ himself on at least three separate occasions to confirm to Thomas that Thomas was writing accurately. On the last appearance of Christ, Christ said to Thomas, You have written well of me, Thomas. What would you have as your reward? Thomas said, Nothing but thee, Lord. St. Thomas once told St. Bonaventure that his greatest source of knowledge was not books, but the crucifix. And when in need of an answer to difficult questions, he would pray before a crucifix, petition his guardian angel, and even put his ear to the tabernacle. He did this so much that one time his guardian angel appeared to him to tell him that certain things are to remain mysteries until one goes to heaven and to stop asking him. Pope Urban IV, who instituted the Feast of Corpus Christi, asked St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure to each compose a sequence for the Mass. And after writing them, they both went to the Pope, and St. Thomas read his first. By the time Thomas finished, Bonaventure, having been literally enraptured by the beauty of Thomas's words, had ripped up his own piece, for in his opinion, it was nothing compared to what Thomas had written. But alas, even Thomas would cease writing and said even that what he himself wrote was all but straw after having received a vision from heaven. When St. Thomas was dying and made his general confession, the confessor left the room in tears and said that Thomas's confession was like that of a five-year-old. At the Council of Trent, his Summa Theologia was put on the altar next to the Bible, and many of the canons of the Council of Trent were almost lifted verbatim from the Summa. Pope after Pope after Pope has given approbation to Thomism and the works of Thomas, for he gives us an intellectual framework by which we can view reality with unmatched clarity and sufficient distinctions, something which no other philosophical system can claim. Now, it is worth mentioning that neither Thomas's teaching nor Thomism are novel or somehow a rupture from the philosophical and theological thought of the church in the past, as some try to say. On the contrary, it was said that Thomas knew and humbly respected the fathers so much that it was as if he inherited all of their knowledge and intellects. When the Pope commissioned him to put together the Catina Aurea, a verse-by-verse compilation of gospel commentaries from over 80 church fathers, he knew the fathers so well that he did the entire thing from memory. In fact, his veneration for the fathers was so great that when him... And one of his Dominican brothers approached Paris and saw the beautiful city. The brother said to Thomas, what I would give to have that city. St. Thomas replied by saying that he would give the entire city just to have the one missing page from St. John Chrysostom's commentary on Matthew. St. Thomas is thus often described as the culmination and perfection of the fathers. And thus, as one author puts it, when one reads St. Augustine, through his brilliance, one can still see a fallen man. In Thomas's writing, it seems as if God could have written it himself. So, when someone says that they don't really like Thomas, but prefer to go back to the sources, that is, the fathers, your alarm bell should start going off because such a statement shows that this person understands neither Thomas nor the fathers. Now, as anyone who has studied the history of philosophy can tell you, all of modern philosophy that is, from Descartes onwards, can be described as one giant revolt against the philosophy of St. Thomas. As the great philosopher, theologian, and priest of the 20th century, Cornelio Fabro, who specialized in the more platonic aspects of Thomas, so comprehensively proves in his 1,200-page book, God in Exile, 
Modernism in the church and widespread atheism have their roots in modern philosophy, starting most proximately with Descartes. And the degree to which the subsequent modern philosophers departed from Thomas is the degree to which they further contributed to the spread of modernism and atheism in our times. Descartes denied Thomas's teaching that knowledge starts with the senses, and he opened the door to rationalism and skepticism, saying that we cannot trust our senses, but only our own minds. David Hume went further and denied Thomas's distinctions in causality, since he said that since we can't see causality in the same way that we can see a pool table, perhaps, we therefore cannot say we know whether or not causality exists. And for example, whether one pool ball hitting another pool ball causes the second pool ball to move. Nor can we rationally predict how it will move. Even if we have gotten the same result every single time we have tried it in the past. This is David Hume. It is worth noting that before David Hume, just about no philosophers doubted God's existence, at least after Christ, that is, since St. Thomas's arguments from causality so comprehensively prove God's existence. The only way out of St. Thomas's arguments is to doubt causality itself. In a nutshell, David Hume basically says that it's as irrational to believe in God as it is to believe that if you drop a ball, it will fall. I'll let you judge the veracity of that argument. Kant, being influenced by both, started to turn the basis for reality from the objective to the subjective. And then eventually, with modern phenomenology, we have that re reality is less about, well, reality. That is, objective reality in the outside world. But merely my perception of it and the phenomena it causes in my mind. That's the real reality, all in my head, they say. There are, of course, countless more examples but the point is that all of this modern philosophy is, even according to their own words, a violent revolt against Thomas. Descartes said that he wanted to be the new father of philosophy, replacing Aristotle and Thomas. Hume said he wanted to do away with the nonsensical metaphysics of Thomas. We could go on, but you get the point. So, how has this philosophical revolution against Thomas influenced the church? Well, as Pope St. Pius X put it, modernism is the wedding of Catholicism and modern philosophy. Modern philosophy is a revolt against Thomas, and thus modernism is a revolt against Thomas, among other things. All of the modernists either hated St. Thomas, or, as in the case of many of the influential theologians of Vatican II, they tried to reconcile Thomas with the modern philosophers who themselves rejected Thomas. But as Thomas teaches us, two contraries can't exist in the same thing at the same time and in the same respect. That is, you can't reconcile Thomas with modern philosophers who reject Thomas and systematically start with contrary premises and principles. You can't wed Christ and Bayel because everything Bayel stands for is a rejection of Christ. Similarly, you can't wed Thomas and the moderns because everything the moderns stand for is a rejection of Thomas. Thus, the so-called neo-Thomists of the 20th century, such as Karl Rahner, von Balthasar, Yves Congar, Gilson, Chenu, Skillebex, Maritain, Dulubach, Kuhn, and all of those types, to varying degrees, of course, are not real Thomists. But rather, as Father, Father Gary Goulagrange of Holy Memory put it, philosophical schizophrenics. Now, just as virtually all of the modern errors of the day can be traced back to a rejection of Thomas, by going to Thomas, we will be able to find the answers to these errors. And just as there is nothing new under the sun, every ancient error that has resurfaced again in modern times can be answered again by Thomas in the same way that he answered those very same errors 800 years ago. Let us now conclude by quickly considering a few of the modern errors that we all come across today and show how Thomas helps us refute them. St. Thomas helps us refute atheism. For the atheists say that everything came forth from nothing, and this could happen without a God. Using St. Thomas, we know that such a statement is absolutely absurd, and here is why. As Catholics, we say that God brought something from nothing. Atheists say that nothing brought something from nothing. But if nothing brought something from nothing, that means nothing caused the bringing forth. But if nothing is a cause, it's no longer nothing, but something, namely a cause. Which means that they are logically required to say that a cause brought forth something from nothing. 
Because a cause must be proportional to its effect, as St. Thomas teaches us and shows, if the effect, namely bringing something from nothing, takes infinite power, since the gap between nothing and something is infinite, then the cause must have infinite power. The only thing anyone would or could describe as having infinite power is God. Now, an atheist might object and say, very clever, St. Thomas, but you're just engaging in word manipulation and sophistry. Since I'm not saying that nothing, as an entity, is the cause, but rather that there was simply no cause, that is, that there was no cause for something coming from nothing. Rather, as Dawkins puts it, because the gap between something and nothing is so small, it just jumped out from nothing into existence. This statement from Dawkins, however, is logically incoherent on two accounts. Firstly, because if it jumped into existence from nothing, that means that it was the cause of its own existence, which means that there then is a cause, not no cause. Secondly, as St. Thomas teaches us, to say that something caused itself, that is, it did not exist, and then brought out its own existence, is absolutely ridiculous, because causes precede effects. If it did not exist, and then caused itself to exist, it must have already existed, since something that does not exist can't be a cause. And causes must be in existence in order to cause anything. In other words, as Thomas says, going from non-being to being requires a cause. It cannot cause itself, since that would violate the principle of non-contradiction. If it is a cause, it is a being. If it needs to be caused, it is non-being. You can't be both in being and non-being at the same time. Therefore, nothing can bring about its own existence from nothing. And again, because the gap between nothing and something is infinite, infinite power is required, and thus we have God. St. Thomas helps us refute evolution, for he proves that the effect cannot exceed the cause. In other words, you cannot give what you don't have. Someone who only has $10 can only give $10. Similarly, inorganic material, which does not have life, cannot magically mutate to somehow give life and make organic material. You can't give life unless you have it. Thus, it is just as likely that lifeless inorganic material would magically mutate into living organic material as it is that if I were to spill a glass of milk on the floor, it would spell the words of the Summa Theologia. It's impossible because the effect cannot exceed the cause. And to all those who subscribe to theistic evolution and somehow try to say that Thomas and evolution are compatible, St. Thomas says in the Summa, that what the Bible says in Genesis regarding everything happening in the Garden of Eden is to be taken as a literal and historical account of the events which took place. That is, God created Adam and Eve exactly how Genesis says, not from billions of years of evolution. St. Thomas helps us refute Teilhard de Chardin and all other similar theories that say that God is evolving and becoming better and better until the so-called omega point is reached. If this evolution is true, this would mean, according to St. Thomas, that God is not perfect, since if you are perfect, you cannot improve over time. You're already perfect. No room to improve. That's the definition of perfection. So, for Teilhard de Chardin, God is not really perfect until he's at the omega point, which means that he believes in an imperfect God, which, St. Thomas teaches us, is really no God at all. Lastly, and most controversially perhaps, St. Thomas helps us refute a particular idea being spread by a certain well-known layperson who has written many books about theology of the body, that the conjugal act is somehow this very sacred and high form of prayer and worship in and of itself, and an image of the Most Holy Trinity. On the contrary, St. Thomas teaches us that what we have in common with God, that is, what makes us made in his image and likeness, is our possession of immaterial faculties, namely the intellect and the will. And this is because God is immaterial. Our lower faculties and appetites, such as our generative faculty and sexual appetites, are base in that which we have in common with the animals. They are beastly, not bad, not evil. They're good in themselves, but nonetheless beastly and animalistic. Thus, to say that the sexual act and sexuality are somehow an image of the Trinity or the Godhead is absolutely backwards since it is the part of man that is precisely not in common with God, according to St. Thomas. Likewise, prayer consists primarily in the raising of the higher faculties to God. 
To say that the conjugal act in itself is a form of prayer is obviously false because animals cannot pray. Furthermore, this ridiculous notion of the conjugal act being a form of worship and prayer in itself is exactly what the pagans who practice temple prostitution believe. Using Thomas's terms, the two beliefs, that is, the beliefs of this particular lay author, that the conjugal act is itself a prayer, and the beliefs of the pagans who practice temple prostitution, believing that it was a form of prayer, are essentially the same, but differ only accidentally. That is, both believe that the conjugal act, when done in the context that God or the gods like, is a window to the divine. They only disagree about the context that God or the gods like. One says this prayer can only be done by couples in the bedroom who are married. The other say it must be done in the temples with prostitutes. St. Thomas refuted the errors of the pagans in the past, and he will do so again. Now, one may object and say that we are made in the image of likeness in God with respect to the primacy of Christ, that is, having our bodies made like unto his body, and thus we have bodies in common with Christ, not just our immaterial faculties. But let us recall that Christ was celibate and did not engage in the conjugal act, even though he had a body. If it was such a high form of prayer in itself, why deprive himself of honoring his father in this way? Why did the Blessed Virgin Mary and well over 99% of the canonized saints deliberately deprive themselves of this particular high form of prayer? Now, one may also object and observe that it is true that it is meritorious to render the marital debt. But, using St. Thomas's distinctions, we know that it is not meritorious qua the act itself or in virtue of the act itself, but only in virtue of rendering due justice to one's spouse under the virtue of justice. Thus, the act is not meritorious in itself. Lastly, one might object that the conjugal act is sacred because it is a participation in God's creative power and the bringing forth of children who are made in the image and likeness of God. But again, using St. Thomas's distinctions, it is only sacred in terms of its effect, that is, the bringing of children and the participation of creation, not in its means, that is, the conjugal act itself. While we could go on, I think the point is clear. When in need of answering modern errors and defending the faith, go to Thomas. As they say, ite ad tomam. The popes have repeated it over and over. Regarding the place of Thomism, that is the philosophy of St. Thomas, as the philosophy of the church, which it is, one might object that the church has not solemnly defined Thomism as the philosophy of the church, although the popes have called it such. But... This is not because it is not true that Thomism is the philosophy of the church, but only because it would then be a matter of faith that Thomism is the philosophy of the church, not a matter of reason. In other words, reason is sufficient to establish Thomism as the true and most accurate philosophical system, and thus the philosophy of the church. Church definitions are for matters of faith, and faith is not necessary for this. But nonetheless, in the encyclical Doctoris Angelici, Pope St. Pius X warned that the teachings of the Church cannot be understood without the basic philosophical underpinnings of Aquinas' major theses. Quote, The capital theses in the philosophy of St. Thomas are not to be placed in a category of opinions capable of being debated one way or another, but are to be considered as the foundations upon which the whole science of natural and divine things is based. If such principles are once removed or in any way impaired, it must necessarily follow that the students of the sacred sciences will ultimately fail to perceive so much as the meaning of the words in which the dogmas of divine revelation are proposed by the magistracy of the church. End quote. We must reject the modern philosophy that the modernists have tried to wed to Catholicism in place of Thomas and Thomism and go back to Thomas if we are to fix the mess that we are in with respect to modernism. For, as the popes have said, Thomas is the antidote to modernism. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. According to the French spiritual writers, We must be an extension of the incarnate life of Christ on earth, living his life. How well we live Christ's life on earth will be proportional to how we will reflect his glory after this life. Our Lady, as the Immaculate Conception, was perfectly conformed to the image of Christ from the start. Since we are not conceived without sin, we certainly need her to help us 
But it is also good to look to other saints who reached this perfect transformation into Christ and learn how to conform to that image of Christ, which we do not yet perfectly have. According to Pope Leo XIII, St. Francis of Assisi was the complete model of Christian perfection. We will now look to St. Francis of Assisi, whom Our Lady made so much like Christ that he was even physically like Christ in the wounds on his hands, feet, and side, but most importantly in his virtues. St. Francis was born in Assisi in the year 1182 to Pietro de Bernardon de Morricone and Pica de Bolemon. While in labor, his mother Pica could not give birth to Francis until she was brought to an animal stable so that Francis would be like Christ even in his birth. He grew up learning to be a merchant like his father. He was a foolish young man but is said to have never committed one mortal sin. He fought in a battle against Perugia around 1202 and after being imprisoned at Colostrada for one year was released to find himself ill. This illness began to stir an awareness in his heart that this world is passing away. After regaining his strength, he began preparing to follow a nobleman to Apulia on a military expedition to become a knight. After packing his things, he had a vision of a room full of armor and a beautiful bride. He awoke with excitement, thinking he was about to prosper in his worldly endeavors. After this experience, Francis, while half asleep, heard someone ask him where he was going. Francis replied with an explanation about his efforts to become a knight and then received the following question. Is it better to be rewarded by the master or the servant? Francis responded, the master. The heavenly voice continued, then why are you leaving the master for the servant? The rich Lord for the poor man. Francis, after this Pauline-like experience, had to face a serious question, whether he would serve God or mammon. He realized he could not have both at the same time. Soon after this, he rebuilt the church of St. Damien, having heard the crucifix there speak to him, where Christ asked him to help rebuild his church, which was falling into ruins. It was clear later to Francis that Christ did not mean a physical church building, but literally the Catholic church founded on St. Peter. Francis eventually strips himself naked in front of the bishop as a sign of his putting on the new man, left his earthly father for the love of our heavenly father, and began to live the life of Christ in a real and manly way, as a knight for his creator and heavenly king. He lived a life of strict poverty and begging, which soon attracted many followers. His first disciples were twelve in number, as Christ had twelve apostles. One of these first friars, Brother Giovanni, eventually left and hanged himself like Judas. The first one to follow Francis was a certain Bernard. Hear how Bernard decided to take on such a life. One night, Francis was taken in by Bernard, who gave him a bed in his own room. Francis went to bed and pretended to sleep, so that Bernard thought he was asleep. When Francis thought Bernard was sleeping, hearing his loud snores, he got up to pray. Bernard, who was also pretending to sleep, saw Francis in prayer, saying over and over again, My God and my all. This experience was enough to inspire Bernard to leave all things behind and follow this humble saint. It did not take long for Francis to attract many followers, so that his friars numbered in the thousands when he died, 5,000. We will now look at Francis' life as a friar to see how much it was like the life of Christ in his public ministry. While he is known as the saint who stressed the need to respect God's creation at times, he was not the nature fanatic he is made out to be. Ironically, he actually wrote in one of his first rules for his friars a prohibition from even having animals in common. The reason why he was delighted to see God's creation was because he knew the purpose of these creatures, that is the glory of God. There was one time when a certain lamb would follow Francis and the friars into church and kneel before the altar of Our Lady of the Lamb, bleating while the friars chanted the divine office. And at Mass, the lamb would bow and bend its knees during the elevation. It seems to me an extraordinary thing like this was meant to chide men for their lukewarmness. Just like Jesus, 
Francis worked many miracles and even cast out devils. There once was a leper for whom the friars were carrying in a certain hospital, who was so insulting in his language towards them and his blasphemy against Christ and his mother, and he was constantly whipping the friars so that many thought he was possessed. When his blasphemies against Jesus and Mary got so bad that the friars abandoned him so as not to be a cause for his blaspheming, Francis himself, hearing of the situation, came to visit the man. The man did nothing but complain, but Francis bore this with meekness, returning words of peace. Realizing the leper's affliction by an evil spirit, Francis left the man to pray. On coming back, he offered to care for him himself, to which the leper reluctantly agreed. Francis told him he would do for him whatever he wanted to help him in his affliction of body. The man asked Francis to wash his body as it was horribly stinky. Wherever Francis cleaned, the leper's flesh was made whole. At the same time, tears of compunction began to flow from the leper's eyes as he mourned for his sins. St. Francis, seeing the miracle that took place, just like Christ, fleeing the crowds who wanted to make him king, fled immediately so as to hide from any excited people. Fifteen days later, the cured leper, having done penance, fell ill and died a holy death after being anointed. He then appeared to St. Francis, who was praying at the time, and thanked him to tell him he was in heaven. On another occasion, when Francis came to Rieti, he went to a church outside the town. So many people came to see him that the vineyard of the priest at the church was trampled and destroyed. The priest regretted letting Francis come to his church. Francis knew the priest's thoughts and asked him how many measures of wine the vineyard would produce in good situations. The priest said, Twelve. Francis replied, asking the priest if he could continue staying at the church and if the people could continue to take grapes from the destroyed vineyard for love of God. He also promised the priest that if he agreed to this, the vineyard would produce twenty measures of wine during the year. Sure enough, the priest agreeing with Francis saw twenty measures of the best wine that year at vintage time. Having considered Francis' conformity to Christ and his miracles and his direct influence in the lives of others, let us now consider his conformity to Christ and his suffering and his own personal life with God. It is said that Francis experienced the dark night of the soul for ten years. Work of a physical nature is hard. Work of an intellectual nature is even harder but the spiritual life is the hardest, and therefore the manliest work there is. When a man embraces penance, prayer, and suffering for the love of God, not for what he will get out of it, you have what is called a true man. This was St. Francis of Assisi, especially on Mount Alverna. He went to this mountain to pray and prepare himself for death in a cell he made for himself. Not long after arriving on this mountain, Francis was outside contemplating his surroundings when it was revealed to him by heaven that the large chasms he beheld at that moment were created by the earthquake that happened at the death of his divine master. This was all it took to begin his ultimate crucifixion on that mountain. He began to experience the greatest spiritual consolations and even levitated under the watch of his special companion, Brother Leo. Sometimes Francis was so high in the air and radiated so much that Brother Leo could hardly see him. Since his fast, in honor of St. Michael was approaching, which would begin on the Feast of the Assumption, Francis, growing even deeper in his contemplations, wanted an even more isolated place to pray and fast. Brother Leo helped him make a hut in a more hidden place, to which place Francis would only allow Leo to come if, on calling Francis, he replied. He said this because sometimes his prayer was so intense that he could not speak or feel anything for a day and a night at a time. In this new place of solitude, Francis became more involved in serious penance and even had physical attacks from the devil. When a man is determined, he knows how to get what he wants. Francis wanted Christ and him crucified, and this he got. While Francis was weakening in body due to his fasts, for consolation, he once began to meditate on the life of the saints in heaven. He prayed to taste their joy. An angel then appeared to him with a violin and drew the bow one time across it. Francis was so consoled that he thought he would die if the angel continued. The crucifixion of Francis was nearing even faster, and one time Brother Leo heard Francis praying repetitively, 
Who are you, my dearest God? And what am I, your vilest little worm and useless servant? Then, as God is attracted by humility, Leo saw a torch of fire come out of heaven and rest on the holy head of St. Francis. He heard God's voice come out of the flame and speak with Francis, followed by Francis holding his hand out three times to the flame. The torch then returned to heaven. During this time, as Francis later told Brother Leo, God asked him to give him three gifts. Francis replied, humbly asking what to offer, since all he had was his habit. God said, Put your hand in your bosom and offer me whatever you find there. Francis, doing what he was told, pulled out a large coin and offered it to the Almighty. This happened three times in all. Francis knew immediately that these three coins were poverty, chastity, and obedience. And the evangelical counsels which make the baptized soul most like Christ when fully lived in the religious state. Now, on the day before the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, an angel appeared to Francis, as an angel appeared to Christ in the Garden of Olives on the day before his crucifixion. This angel said, I encourage you and urge you to prepare and to dispose yourself humbly to receive with all patience what God wills to do in you. Francis replied that he was ready to bear whatever his Lord wanted. Finally, his Good Friday came. On September 14th, 1224, the Feast of the Holy Cross, the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, Francis faced the East and prayed that before he died, he would be given the grace to suffer in soul and body the passion of Christ and feel the great love of Christ's heart which moved him to suffer for sinners. Not long after, a crucified seraph came out of heaven, which sight moved Francis to joy and sorrow, as it were, at the same time. Nearby farmers later said they saw a fire on the mountain, which was so bright that some people thought the sun had already risen. After this vision in which Christ told Francis of his desire that he be his standard bearer, Francis soon discovered the wounds of Christ appear in his hands, feet, and side. Nails even appeared in his hands and feet, so as to cause him great pain in walking, for which he needed special sandals. Thus was Francis crucified. When Francis came down the mountain, he performed many miracles with his stigmata, such as the time when he was traveling with a man in the cold. On this occasion, when stopping for the night, the man began to cry out and blame Francis for his having to sleep in such cold weather. Francis touched the man with his wounded hand, and a great warmth immediately inundated the man's body. Need we speak of his bodily death? All we must say is that just as he was like Christ in his birth, life, and crucifixion, so was he like Christ in his death. He had the friars lay him naked on the ground so that he could die like Christ. Francis died in 1226 and was canonized in 1228, two years later. It seems Christ's church is once again falling into ruins, and we are in need of not a few walking crucifixes like St. Francis. What would you do if you found yourself in a field amidst a host of children who are yelling, shouting, cursing, and making all sorts of mischief. St. John Bosco was first confronted with such a scene in a dream he had at the age of nine. In his dream, he attempted to subdue the children. At first, he tried persuasion, but he soon resorted to threats and blows. Then the rascals turned into all sorts of wild beasts. A mysterious man came up to him and said, No, don't use violence. Be gentle if you want to win their friendship. Then the wild beast changed into timid, submissive lambs, while a woman's kindly voice rose sweetly above the scene and said to him, Take your crook and lead them out to pasture. Upon waking, John Bosco had a strong conviction that he was being called to the priesthood. Born of Francis and Margaret Bosco on August 16, 1815, the future saint was the youngest of three sons. Francis, a peasant farmer of the Piedmont area of northern Italy, died of pneumonia only two years after John's birth. Margaret, a devout and industrious woman, did not remarry, but rather managed a home and the three children alone. Although she was illiterate, she had a good grasp of the catechism. 
and solid prayer life, which she diligently passed on to her boys. After John experienced his dream about the children for the first time, Margaret took seriously his desire to become a priest and immediately began to pray and look for an opportunity for John to begin his studies. The opportunity arose when a group of local people, including the aged priest Don Colasso, were walking home after attending a nearby mission, a parish mission. To make the time pass, Don Colasso sought to test young Bosco's grasp of the mission. He was astounded to discover that the lad had not only memorized the talks, but also comprehended them, since he could break down each talk into a logical outline. Realizing the boy's potential, Don Colasso offered to teach him Latin. This was the beginning of an arduous and long trial of education. John's education was difficult, not because he lacked talent, but because he was a peasant. Both the teachers and the students of the local schools shunned the poor boy from the peasant districts. His oldest brother, Anthony, did everything to convince John against becoming a priest as well. It seemed everybody was against him. And finally, John had to walk up to 12 miles a day to attend school while still helping his brother Anthony in the fields. Yet this same peasant boy would someday become a master of the pen, publishing over 130 works, including tracts on religion, apologetic works, school books, histories, biographies, and novels. And he is one of the patrons of writers. Yet John Bosco, his talents extended beyond the classroom, for he was very athletic and nimble, able to perform acrobatic feats to thrill almost any audience. He even put on his own Sunday afternoon shows, pull off sleight of hand, magic tricks, juggling, tightrope walking, and other acrobatics. The price of admission, everyone present, must join in praying the rosary or listening to a summary of the morning sermon. All his life, he remained an enthralling storyteller. Once he found an older acrobat distracting people from attending Sunday Mass in the town square. Sizing up the situation, he challenged this man to a duel, an acrobatic duel. If he won the man would have to vacate the area and leave the people to fulfill their obligations. The challenge accepted. They performed their acrobatics without either clearly winning the victory. Finally, it was decided that whoever could climb the highest in the nearby tree would win. Up went the acrobat. It seemed impossible to go any higher without falling. Bosco bested him. He went up and did a handstand on the upper limbs such that his feet stuck out of the top of the tree. He won. After Don Colasso died, John attended various local schools without much progress until he entered a school of liberal arts in nearby Chieri. In order to keep his place in school, he had to work various odd jobs like tailoring and making shoes. After graduation in 1834, Bosco contemplated joining the Franciscans in order to alleviate the financial burden of tuition his family and friends were paying on his behalf. But after seeking the advice of his new confessor, St. Joseph Cafaso, he entered the local seminary in Chieri. The portion of John's seminary training that was not paid by the charity of others or the monetary awards won by talent contests Don Cafaso himself paid. Now here is the advice of Bosco's mother, Margaret, at that time when he took on the habit, the cassock. She said, now you have put on your cassock, my dear John. You can surmise the joy and the sweetness that fill my heart with this event. But remember that it is not the habit that honors your state, but the practice of virtue. 
If you should unfortunately ever come to have any doubts as to your vocation, I beg you to do nothing unworthy of your cloth. Take it off at once. For I would rather have my son should be a poor peasant than a priest who neglects his duty. When you came into the world, I consecrated you to the Blessed Virgin. When you began your schooling, I recommended you almost exclusively to the Madonna. Now I beg you to belong to her entirely. Love those who love her, and if you are someday a priest, constantly promote devotion to the Good Mother. With advice like that from a mother, wow, how could John fail? Over six years later, John was ordained on June 5th, 1841, and immediately received three offers, three positions. But once again, Don Cafaso counseled him to continue his studies by entering a seminary in Turin that was specifically established to ensure a sound complement of theological studies for the younger clergy. The rule at the seminary was designed to train the young clerics gradually to the indispensable habits of the sacerdotal life, morning and evening prayers, visits to the Blessed Sacrament, recitation of the Holy Rosary, half an hour's meditation, a quarter of an hour's spiritual reading, all of these in common, weekly confession, a slight mortification on Fridays, silence except during recreation, monthly recollection, study in common, a daily evening walk in pairs, far from much frequented places, and public shows and going to cafes were strictly forbidden. No theaters. Once at Turin, Don Bosco not only studied the mysteries of our faith, but also discovered the field of his apostolate. Turin, the capital of Piedmont, was quickly developing. Between 1838 and 1848, Turin's population increased 17%, and in the next 10 years, another 31%. Consequently, hordes of boys descended on the capital from all over Piedmont and beyond, looking for work in the thriving mills, factories, and construction projects. Cheap labor, right? Many of the youths coming to the city were orphans. Others were seasonal farm workers, and some were from broken families running away. On December 8, 1841, while waiting for a server at, in the sacristy, Our Lady's Feast Day, a, bo a poorly clad boy of 16 stumbled into the room without any apparent motive. John Bosco quizzed the boy and found him to be uncatechized, illiterate, and an orphan. Our Lady had sent John his first client. The youth returned to Bosco for training in the catechism with some of his friends. This was the beginning. Soon one boy turned into 10 and 10 into 50 until John had 300 boys calling on him by the time he graduated from the seminary. Every Sunday and feast day, he gathered these poor, abandoned youths of Turin, heard their confessions, said Mass for them, preached in a language they could understand, in other words, at their level, led them in games and hikes, told them stories, and listened to their problems. During the week, he visited them in their homes, if they had them. If not, he found places for them to have a home, places to stay. In the following two years, the number of boys would grow to several hundred. Such large numbers caused problems because there was no place in Turin that would put up with them for very long. Every time a place was arranged, the group would soon ask to leave. And that was during this time that the clergy of Turin, even some of Don Bosco's closest friends, thought he was going insane. He kept telling them of what they thought were outlandish, grandiose plans, such as his saying, I shall soon have a large building with playgrounds, evening classes, workshops, a church to hold 500 lads, and plenty of priests, catechists, masters, foremen to help me in my works. Upon hearing such plans repeated, a 
couple of the clergy decided to have him evaluated. They contracted or contacted two ecclesiastics from Turin who showed up to verify what they had heard about the previously high esteemed Don Bosco. Once they heard for themselves that he had become unhinged or megalomaniac, they asked him to go for a little ride in their carriage. After Don Bosco tricked them to enter the carriage without him, he sharply bade the driver to make haste for the asylum. When the carriage arrived inside the gates of the asylum, many embarrassing hours were required to straighten out the misunderstanding. Henceforward, no one said anything about the incurable mental affliction of Don Bosco. The realization of Bosco's, Don Bosco's grandiose plans began to take place in 1846, when he leased and soon purchased an old house with its attached shed and fields. The shed he turned into a chapel, the house into a home for himself and his mother. This was the humble beginnings of what he envisioned as a place of prayer and spiritual formation and other levels of formation, calling it the oratory. It was much more than that, though. As I said, it had other levels of formation. For it was a place to play and make friends, a school, an employment service, and later became a home for many. In 1851, the makeshift chapel located in the shed was replaced by a church named after the patron of the oratory, St. Francis de Sales. In 1852, a dormitory was built to house 150 boys. And in 1853, a factory was also built that enabled many boys to work at home away from corruptive outside influences. In the factory, the boys learned trades such as binding, cobbling, tailoring, and printing. The intellectually talented boys were sent to school, after which they returned to teach others. The oratory was so successful that before long, two more oratories were opened in Turin itself. By 1850, Don Bosco began to single out the lads that had potential for priestly vocations. Twenty-two of these boys remained to become the first to take the habit of Don Bosco's fledgling religious congregation, the Society of St. Francis de Sales, commonly known as the Salesians of Don Bosco. Rapid expansion continued so that by 1863, oratories were established in other Italian cities, followed by, in 1875, by establishments in France and Spain and England and eventually in almost every country of South America. In 1872, with Sister Mary Dominica Mazzarello, Bosco founded the Daughters of Mary Help of Christians to do the same work for poor girls that the Salesian priests and brothers were doing for boys. At the time of John Bosco's death, in 1888, the Salesians numbered 1,400. Now, the method employed by St. John Bosco in dealing with with his fellow man, and especially children, is a method worthy of consideration and imitation. After all, it came to him from Our Lady herself, and this method produced saints like Michael Rua and Dominic Savio, the first schoolboy to be canonized. Just what is this method? First of all, before his ordination to the priesthood, Don Bosco made a resolution to imitate the charity and gentleness of St. Francis de Sales. As a result, he never used direct punishment on his boys, but instead used friendliness, appreciation of effort, fostering a sense of responsibility and removing the occasions of disobedience. Furthermore, he sought to establish a partnership between himself and the young, he brought in the street urchins and transformed them into lambs through his love and constant concern. He trained them in ways of Christian living, bringing them to frequent confession, frequent communion, and common recitation of the rosary. He trained them in the trades of the world so that they could live a respectable life. That was secondary. Primary was the spiritual. They, in turn, helped the newcomers along the same path and grew up to become good religious, good husbands, 
and always good citizens. Blessed Michael Rua, who took his place as superior of the Salesians after he died in 1888, has this to say, to pass on what he did. So Don Rua wrote this to his sons about devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. He said, nothing could be more Salesian than this devotion, because it is the sacred heart of our master that will draw, as educators, the very pure love for youth the gentleness and the leniency that must accompany our words and our actions, the patience in the frustrations and trials inherent in our task, the spirit of sacrifice and zeal for souls. Later, in his circular letters to the Salesians, Don Rua recommended youth clubs above all, insisting that they keep their first goal, the first goal of the Salesians under John Bosco, music, Theater and sports are means to an end, nothing more, he wrote. Where they are useful and nowhere else can they be used, but always with prudence to draw in the youth and to ensure their perseverance. The goal is the teaching of religion and the formation of souls, not to play a game not to enjoy some pastime. Sometimes we can get confused about these things. So we too can imitate John Bosco's method by treating our fellow man with gentleness and patience. He abhorred peer pressure. He didn't like it. He didn't use it, and it wasn't effective. From his notes before ordination, St. John Bosco wrote this, A priest never goes to heaven or hell alone. If he is faithful to his vocation, he goes to heaven with the souls which his good example has saved. If he does ill and scandalizes his brethren, he goes to hell with the souls damned through his bad example. This thought will help me to strain every nerve to keep the following resolutions. Here are some of them. I will be scrupulous in the use of my time. When the salvation of souls is at stake, I will be always ready to suffer, to act, and to humiliate myself. May the charity and gentleness of St. Francis de Sales illumine every step I take. Will always show myself satisfied with the food set before me, unless it be really harmful to my health. Since work is potent weapon against the enemies of my salvation, I will give only five hours a night to sleep. In the day, especially after lunch, I will take no rest except when ill. Every day I will devote some time to meditation and to spiritual reading. During the day, I will make a short visit, at any rate, a prayer to the Blessed Sacrament. My preparation for Mass shall take at least a quarter of an hour, and so shall my thanksgiving. These are resolutions of a saint before he's ordained. In his great build-up of his work at Turin, his mother Margaret came to him saying mournfully one day, I can't do it anymore. You see all the trouble I take and yet nothing comes of it. I can't stand these boys. Today I find all the washing I had hung up trampled on the ground. Yesterday they ran over all my growing vegetables. Some come back at night with their clothes all in rags, others without neckties or shoes or handkerchiefs. Some of them hide their shirts. Others take my saucepans to play with. It takes hours to find all these things. I have had enough of it. I tell you, I can't go on any longer. And just think how quiet I was at Betchy doing my spinning. Let me go back to end my days there. Don Bosco's only reply was to point to the crucifix hanging on the wall. Mother Margaret understood, and her eyes filled with tears. You are right. You are right. She said, went back down and put on her apron. January 31st, 1888, Don Bosco rendered his soul to God. 
shortly thereafter received in an audience by Leo the Thirteenth. Blessed Michael Rua told him, I still hear Don Bosco telling us again and again, a few hours before his death, the Pope, the Pope, the Salesians must defend the Pope's authority everywhere and always. The Pope, these are his dying words. This is one of the part of the hour, or the cross, the heavy cross that we have to bear today. Let us take these dying words of Don Bosco to heart and say, you're right. You're right. The Pope, the Pope, the Salesians must defend the Pope's authority everywhere and always.